Simmons. I'm a Tetration Technical Solutions Architect. And as a part of the Tetration Lightboard series, what we're going to do is kind of walk you through uh, an example of how cloud workload protection works. So if you're not familiar with cloud workload protection, uh, I'm fairly certain that you will in, not too, uh, in the not too distant future because it is uh, an up and coming industry term that really kind of deals with how cloud workload uh, and application endpoints uh, are basically going to be protected in, in the upcoming future. So there's basically three ways that we look at doing cloud work workload protection. The first way is actually going in and controlling the communications of the endpoints and, and the, the, uh, the, the components within the application itself. The second thing is with uh, looking at system behavior. And the third thing is vulnerability detection. Vulnerability detection. So I coded them like this because as we go through this example, I'm going to show some of the things that uh, are actually taken advantage of during the attack and how each one of these um, controls could have helped with pro um, protecting this uh, workload in this example. So if we look at, uh, you know, you may be familiar with uh, a, an attack that happened not too long ago that was widely reported in the press, which basically used a vulnerability in the Apache Struts uh, code framework where basically someone out in the internet would connect to a web server that's on basically an allowed port, TCP 443, uh, or port 80, just depends, but in this case I believe it was 443, where they actually get access to the code running on that web server and, and basically execute the vulnerability uh, of the, um, the Apache Struts code. Well, what that allows them to do is once they execute that vulnerability, then they have access to this system through basically any means they want, not just through the web interface on port 443. So what that does is that allows them to basically get you know, root level access and basically escalate their privilege on that machine. Once they escalate their privilege, then they can install software in this case, like scanning software or other types of, um, you know, basically hacker tools. Once they install that software, then they can actually start going and scanning uh, for other systems on that network. Once they have access to the other systems on that network, then they can once again kind of rinse and repeat, uh, repeat and do like, say, a privilege escalation, maybe install some software uh, on another uh, uh, node. Well, once they have all of that stuff in there, then they, they basically can kind of, you know, you know, do whatever they wish at that point. One example in, in this particular case is, is that they basically got into uh, the web server and they were able to execute that vulnerability and then they could scan and see what other systems were there. Once they found that there was a database running by looking around and searching for or scanning for well-known ports, then they could actually, you know, install the software and then they could in initiate basically a persistent connection from the web server to the database server. Which if you, if you basically, if you understand how most uh, tiered architectures work, is usually you'll actually have like say a front end, uh, a front end tier, a middle tier, and basically your back end tier. And this example that I'm using is the web would be the front end, the app would be some sort of middleware, and the database would be the back end. Well, in a traditional architecture like that, the web server will never have any reason whatsoever to talk directly to the database server, right? And so what this uh, attack allowed them to do was basically get access to a network that had no barriers between these different tiers within the application. So just by the nature of this connection to, from the web server to the database, that in, a, in and of itself is bad. The fact that it actually was up and remained persistent for a long time, that even further uh, exacerbates the, the issue. Well, then we can also see things like once this is up, we actually will be able to uh, observe like a large um, uh, data transfer from the database to the web server. And then in, uh, in some cases, we'll see larger than normal data transfers from the web out to something out in the Internet. Right. So, you know, these are, uh, you know, some kind of just some some examples of, of how that stuff uh, would have gone now. The reason why I coded them in the color that I did is that 
the way that the cloud workload protection works within te in Tetration is that our software sensor is watching the events that are going on on each one of these nodes. So when the privilege escalation happens on that web server, we actually have the ability to watch that and we can even send alerts or trigger recordings for what's going on when that, uh, that processor event happens. Well, within that, we can also see that we did a privilege escalation. We could have also seen that we do a, in, uh, basically install some software by running like a, a shell code or some sort of uh, local code that maybe is, um, you know, if this is a Linux box, maybe it reaches out to an internet repository and pulls down some, some software. Then when we initiate a scan and actually look for other nodes on that network, we are actually opening up or creating a TCP port. All three of these things can be noticed and actually alerted on and recorded by Tetration when we have a software sensor in place. We can also go in and create a rule that says, okay, I, I want to alert on all of these, but I want to uh, you know, basically alert or send a specific alert that if I see all three of these in a specific order, uh, or if I see all three of these on a host within a certain amount of time. So I can go in and create rules that say, if I see privilege escalation, install of software, and then a TCP port open for scanning, that's actually a very, very quick uh, note that if a web server is doing that, we know that there's actually something that's nefarious that's going on. Well, beyond that, uh, we actually have the ability to go in and, you know, once we understand the application, which is one of the root functions that, that uh, Tetration has, is that we can go in and basically put the walls up to basically say, okay, this connection from web to database, that should never actually happen. So we can put up the walls through native enforcement or through policy export to do enforcement on, you know, some sort of a network device. We can enforce the fact that the web should never be talking to the database unless it's actually going through the application uh, tier. Same thing on the reverse, right? The database should never be going to the web. We also have the ability to watch the traffic flows in there, and we can report on the types of connections, right? If there's a long-lived connection from a web server to a database server, even if we do decide, okay, web to database is okay, but usually that's a short-lived connection. Maybe that's not something that's going to stay up for a long time. But for these attackers, when they're connecting to, you know, the, the, from the web to anything else, it's going to be quick. But if we see it that lasts a lot longer than it normally should, we can actually provide that information through uh, the Tetration UI as well. Um, the other thing is, when we have a connection into this web server, it normally, depending on what the application is, but normally a traditional web server application from the internet in is actually going to be a very short-lived conversation. That they're going to come in, make their request, and then we're going to send the response and then that conversation's over. You know, basically one of the things that we mentioned here is there's a larger data transfer than normal from the web server out to the internet. So we can actually watch for things like connection uh, persistence and for uh, the amount of data that's sent. So all of this stuff can actually be observed and in some cases actually can be alerted on. Um, then there's one other thing that if we wanted to try to make sure that we are staying well ahead of all of this kind of stuff is that we have the ability to go in and look at all of these different systems here and actually do a software inventory check and then compare that against basically a common vulnerability exposure database that would tell us whether or not we're running software that actually has a known vulnerability that can be attacked. So, you know, again, if they had had something like this cloud workload protection from Tetration in place ahead of time, they could have run a scan and said, okay, we just got a notification that there is a known vulnerability in struts that we could go in and do a quick report on that says, okay, these 10 servers or these 20 servers or these, let's say it's maybe even these two uh, VMs that are running Apache struts are, are vulnerable to this version. It actually allows us to go in and do some uh, basically uh, communications control where we can say, okay, if I find something that's got a, a significant impact vulnerability to us, I'm actually going to go in and shut that down until I can get that remediated. So again, with cloud workload protection, there's actually three different kind of tool sets that sit within this uh, workload protection platform that allows us to do some very sophisticated ways of looking at, analyzing, and providing protection mechanisms for the cloud workloads that we have within our data center or within our public cloud.